everyone. This is our last meeting. meeting is being recorded. Ah, okay, good. So okay, wonderful. Shall I Hello, start? Hello, everyone. Oh. I begin the present. <laughs> this is our last meeting of the semester, and nevertheless, the break is not at all long, because next semester we are scheduled to meet again starting on February the eighteenth. Ioannis. You have the floor. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your coming uh, of our today's last event of the winter term colloquium of arts, mid science and science mid arts. Uh, and a special thank to uh, President, Prof uh, President Prof uh, Professor Klaus Meinzer and the Vice President Birgit Harris for their steady support of this activity. This evening, I'm, I'm looking forward um, to enjoy presentations of uh, Marius Ioan Elia and uh, Karel Lem. Uh, but uh, before I hand over to my dear Violeta, I would like kindly to ask first the Vice President and then the President to greet this evening. Birgit, please. Yes. Uh, I have no, um, I'm no specialist in this uh, themes of this evening, but I'm very, um, uh, engage in, in listening and I'm very it's very interesting for me and so I um, I'm thankful for the invitation to this uh, colloquium and and for your whole work this semester and so thank you so much and uh, also I'm very glad to be together with so many interested colleagues and now please <laughs> go on thank you so much thank you thank you very good and now our president professor Meinzer. yeah um thank you and welcome uh, to you to you all um, at uh, this event the last colloquium science meets arts arts meets uh, science in this semester and uh, this evening i think uh, we will learn more how mm, methods of natural science and uh, technology can influence art. In, um, in the second talk of a chemist, we will learn more about mass spectrometry and how this widely used analytical tool in the natural sciences can be used in arts. And uh, in the first talk of a composer on polymediality, we will learn, I suppose, how modern multimedia technology can influence contemporary music. And even the sounds of automobility and other sounds of our technical environment. Uh, I learned uh, from uh, the uh, um, background uh, information of our guests this evening are involved. Very exciting ideas. As philosopher of uh, science and technology, I'm very curious to learn more about these concepts. Anyway, I'm very happy that uh, this successful uh, colloquium will be continued in the next uh, semester. And uh, the program for the next semester was already announced. And uh, I thank again our deans of class three and four, Violeta Dinescu and Ioannis Liritsis for their really great engagement and organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Uh, dear Violeta, you can start with the first presentation. Thank you. I have the pleasure to present our first speaker, Marios Ioannou Elia, was born on the 19th of June in 1978. He's a Cypriot composer and he studied in Salzburg Mozarteum and in Vienna University, uh, performing arts also, and he earned his PhD in 2010. After his studies, he has taught at various universities in Salzburg, Leipzig, Seoul, Kyoto. Uh, he developed also um, uh, activities of the symphony orchestra at Osaka University, was artistic director at Primori Philharmonic, and is currently an advisory member of the doctoral studies at the Royal Conservatory in Brussels. He is a full member of our European Academy of Sciences and Arts and 
head of the art class on its nomination committee. Uh, he has been the youngest artistic director in the history of the European capital of culture, initiated the realized Sound of Vladivostok, awarded the Grand Prix, Grand Prix Silver Archer of the Far East, and following an invitation by the government of Japan, the audiovisual city symphony Sound of Kyoto. Upcoming premieres include the oratorio Weeping Madonnas, commissioned by the presidency of the Republic of Cyprus, and the trumpet concert Trumpet of God, commissioned by Panon Philharmonic. His latest large-scale symphony work, Liberty, was premiered by the Greek Radio National Symphony Orchestra and Choir in Agora under the Acropolis in Athens. So many things to tell about Elias. His 80 compositions have received numerous international awards all over the world, including the Golden Apple for the best cultural event in Germany in 2011, the Silver Archer Grand Prix in the Far East, the Luciano Berio First Prize in New York, Kazimierz Serotsky First Prize and Lutoslavsky First Prize in Warsaw, and so on and so on. Elias concept is based on polymediality. The concept enables the composition, a polyesthetic and dynamic dialogue between unconventional music and media elements with various art forms. Please, Marius. So dear uh, Violeta, dear everyone, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to share, uh, I would say more the experiences that uh, I was lucky enough uh, to have lived in the past 25 years. And since uh, I am aware of that, uh, uh, many participants of tonight's colloquium are not so uh, academically uh, engaged in music, uh, music philosophy, music theory, uh, and music aesthetics in general. So I decided to make the presentation in such a way that it is more audiovisual. And I think the examples could uh, speak um, by themselves. And uh, since uh, it is a colloquium. I will be very happy if these examples in the end instigate the one or other question so as to uh, start what was uh, actually the basis of the ancient uh, living and society uh, that all took place in the Agora. So I would like to start. Uh, I hope. This is a succinct description of the examples that I am going to give. And uh, I have chosen um, such works that took place in several geographical uh, locations, uh, mainly in Europe, Asia, and Russia. So, uh, so as to start with the first point of what is important in my work, both in theory and in praxis. Uh, this is to uh, find inspiration, and I call it inspiration in the broadest sense, meaning scientific on the one hand, but on the other hand, also the cultural background that uh, consists uh, the cultural uh, complex and society and the cultural evolution of uh, each country. And all this, becomes actually the uh, sources uh, for uh, developing. Please um, mute. Okay, so, and uh, I have chosen five works. I'm going to show examples from four works, but the five I would like to um, give it as an example because it is important and I will explain also later why. So the first work is going to be a Liberty that took place in Athens. The second and the third, they are both connected because they are based on the concept that I started in 2017 and it is called the concept sound of and it's the sound of Kyoto and the sound of Vladivostok. 
And the fourth one took place in the central square of Mannheim in Germany, Otto Symphonic. And the fifth one was a work with which a Guinness World Record has been achieved in Japan. So, and the first work was uh, a commission by the uh, radio and television of Greece. And last year, um, maybe the one or the other of you might know for Greece was an important anniversary because uh, it, we are celebrating the 200 years after the Greek revolution. And this is actually not only important for Greece, but it is actually important for Europe in general. So Liberty, it is a work, although it uh, draws back to this date of 1821, it reflects the efforts of the Greek people, but also of other nations like the French uh, Revolution that has been an inspiration for Greece as well, and vice versa, for many poets and writers and composers and artists in general. So uh, this work took place, and this is the Agora, the so-called Roman Forum of Athens. Uh, you can see this place and it's under the Acropolis. The Parthenon is on the right side of you. So the idea is here that uh, archaeology and ancient history and ancient um, uh, site specific uh, locations get in dialogue with contemporary music. And in this work, you will see that national symbols, uh, national poetry that gets in interaction with um, for example, um, a Commedia of Dante Alighieri, uh, because maybe here it is interesting to say that the national hymn of Greece and is based on the national poet of Solomos, Dionysius Solomos, has been inspired by Dante Alighieri. And this is a very unknown uh, aspect uh, that the work uh, enlightens. And I would like to show a first trailer of this performance. <laughs> So this has been a work that has been transmitted from the national television, both nationally and also through the world channel of Earth. Um, and this is already one aspect that I would like to start speaking about polymediality. This is uh, the communication between the musical performance and the audience. It does not have only this physical um, dimension. And since we had these COVID limitations and all the obstacles and television and uh, media, uh, electronic and digital media in general have been uh, enabled us various ways actually to become creative because as you will see, and this is part of the polymediality concept I'm going to explain later, that different locations are coming together and they take part within a continuous uh, timeline. And as such, they enable the performance of the score. Coming to the score, um, you can see uh, that uh, this work does not only contain uh, traditional elements such as soprano or baritone or narrators or the Constantinople lira name. Uh, this is an Arabic flute, mandolin, and the sanduri or four traditional instruments. And besides the symphony orchestra and the mixed choir, they include soldiers. This is the so-called Evzones uh, company. Uh, you have already seen them in the trailer. They are the ones that stand for the uh, revolution in 1821. And while they hit with their uh, so-called tsaruhi, their shoe uh, on the floor, this is 
has a symbolic uh, message actually of acoustical uh, dimension. And it is so that our ancestors hear that we are still alive and we are continuing their vision of rebuilding. Besides that, there is a group of riflement. So this means machine guns and also cannons. And the score uh, contains 100,011, uh, um, 500, uh, 111,511 notes. It contains 85, 87 parts, and it is really a very complex score. And here, these are two pages from the score, and I don't know if you can see very well, but on the left side, uh, what is marked with gray, this is the line of the cannon shot. And on the right uh, part, uh, the blue uh, marking square, uh, here there shows the Evzones, the so-called soldiers, and their steps. And the, um, the gunshot of the refilement group, so uh, the guns, as well. So as you see, these are uh, extra musical elements. And in this um, music, they take a musical value and they are being handled as musical parameters, as an extra musical uh, line within the score. So everything, it is composed based on a timeline. And the conductor has to conduct uh, everything. And to close this um, example, I'm going to play uh, a longer part of this performance that includes several sections. <laughs>
So this was a um, uh, selection of parts from the piece. The duration of the whole is one hour. And it is not just a hymn for liberty, but it's also a hymn for democracy and uh, justice between the nations. And um, what I would lastly like to mention here is that the whole production has been under the auspices of the president of the Republic of uh, Greece. As a second um, example, I would like to uh, refer to what I have mentioned at the beginning and the uh, investigation and maybe following the question whether each city have, has its own sound. Uh, this is uh, a question that I have been uh, working since 2017, where the first application of the concept sound of has been enabled uh, in the Russian Far East and more precisely in Vladivostok. According to this concept, sound of, it aims to musicalize a city or a geographical area in its entirety by creating a polytope of acoustic and musical events happening in a continuous timeline. Maybe a polytope, uh, if it is not uh, known what it is about, Poly, like polyphony, like polyrhythm or polytonality, and as the concept polymediality is, and top, this is the place, it suggests that different spaces, locations are being connected acoustically and musically, and the medium for connecting these elements together is the medium of film. Coming to the sound of Kyoto, this has been a commission by the government of uh, Japan and section of cultural affairs together with the city of Kyoto and Kyoto Art Center. Uh, the whole project began in 2018 and it is still ongoing. By the end of this year, the final product that is the film uh, in cinematic format will be presented in the cinema. Hopefully that the situation with the pandemic will allow this. Some statistics about this project, uh, 560 musicians take part, 43 institutions, uh, 18 original musical works have been created, uh, 1,650 recorded sounds, and with recorded sounds, uh, these are beyond the recordings of the music compositions. These are individual sounds, soundscapes that someone uh, might uh, hear uh, within this geographical scope of the city. Beyond that, 4,000 video clips and 10,300 documentary photos, all this in one city. Um, very shortly, some examples. Uh, here it's a, a rock band from Kyoto that uses traditional Japanese instruments. Uh, the three persons in the forefront, they play the Japanese taiko drums, while uh, they were two in the back. The one plays uh, a string uh, instrument and the other one uh, a Japanese-like uh, flute. And as you might have seen, the scenery here, this is uh, important for such a project because the weather conditions influence both the acoustical and visual scenery of the city. And uh, the whole process is very long and uh, we are always together, of course, with a team, production team of 52 uh, persons. We are looking for the uh, exemplary and iconic locations uh, in the city. All you see here is natural. We just brought the instruments in front of the temple. The music that they have composed at the beginning is pre-recorded uh, in studio. And this is the uh, phase of the filming. And uh, in addition to this, natural sounds are being recorded. And here, uh, this is um, 
uh, a scenery with which you can imagine both the musical performance on the boat. There are three, uh, four musicians and the sounds of the river and in general what the soundscapes around are being recorded as well. And uh, the film broadcasts uh, the situation uh, as realistic as such uh, in the cinemas or uh, whether it will be presented. And I will explain after how this uh, is being achieved. Uh, this is the recording of the bamboo forest. Uh, in Japan, uh, it's, there is an interesting aspect that the Minister of Environment has set 100 uh, locations uh, that there are preserved because of their acoustical um, uh, idiosyncrasy. And what you see here is one of these 100 nationally certified uh, uh, soundscape, the so-called Sagano bamboo forest, um, by the way, uh, it is to say that to come in such locations, you need a special uh, agreement and a special confirmation by the city and the authorities. So uh, to get in the heart of the bamboo forest, uh, this has been an exception. And the project aims to project all these experiences, acoustical uh, in this case, uh, through the whole project in the cinema. This is a setup and that we made specifically for the project. And I believe it is the first of its kind or as far as I know. Here you see a factory where orange bowls are being made. Orange bowls, you can see maybe uh, on the right side. Uh, these are the so-called in Europe singing bowls. And this is a setup that is being made right in the factory where they produce uh, these instruments. And as you see, uh, there was a, an interaction and a performance between the um, artisans that make with lava uh, the forms, they put the iron inside and the special uh, krama of the material. And on the other hand, uh, there is a performance of this element. And in contrast to the traditional instruments, this is uh, a contemporary avant-gardistic experimental percussion instrument that has been actually originally uh, developed for the World Osaka Exposition in 1970. And uh, these sculptures have been in a way abandoned. And then the Kyoto uh, University of Arts uh, took the role to preserve them and bring them back in the original position, uh, position and condition. And uh, we used this also as part of the project uh, in the dimension of the avant-gardistic and more modern sound elements. Now I would like to play the first trailer of this sound of Kyoto. Before sound of Kyoto, sound of Vladivostok uh, has been realized in 2017. Uh, I would like to start with a trailer of this uh, audiovisual portrait 
as I would call it, so that I believe it will be noticeable that there is a difference in the approach and in the acoustic expression uh, of how these cities has been perceived. So this is a map of the heart of the city of Vladivostok. And this is the map of recordings. On the dots that you can see on the map, this shows uh, some of the locations where music has been performed or sounds have been recorded. There were several categories in this process. The first category is the music performed on stage in concert halls and theaters. And uh, this is as far what we understand as a concert hall like the Philharmonic Society or a theater like the uh, well-known Pushkin Theater, uh, but also locations where art is performed by amateur uh, groups. So this is one aspect of the participatory, participatory um, uh, importance that uh, the whole concept is based so that both professional and amateur, but also sound music enthusiasts of this geographical scope um, contribute in making this uh, whole project. So the second category is music in private sphere. So this means uh, we dive inside the private um, spaces of the people and I try to investigate what is interesting or what is unusual uh, in these locations. For example, Soviet uh, apartments and old school basement studio and so on. And the third is the entire city is a recording platform. This means that elements that are associated with different locations you have seen before, uh, the canon. The canon is um, very uh, important for the city because it reminds of uh, uh, military uh, events and the importance why Vladivostok has been established and uh, it is um, not uh, as it is in Kyoto. Kyoto, as you have seen, is a more traditional, more rich historical city. It has been also uh, for a decade, the capital of Japan. On the other hand, and on the contrary, Vladivostok is a very new city. Uh, it has been uh, established in 1860. So it is actually very modern, very new, a completely different uh, aesthetical view and sound as well. And in general, at eight, oh, more than 80 locations, the above three uh, aspects have been implemented and more than 600 recordings have been made. An important aspect of the city is to engage people, as I have mentioned before. So the participat participatory aspect is very important and this had a strong impact for the citizens of the city. Like here, there have been in total 11 presentations on the process and during the development of the project and uh, all 11 were packed with people. They wanted to know more. They wanted to say their opinion, what is important for the city and which sound is, in their view, uh, critical uh, to record and after analyze. So this is one example. This is the process where the project is being uh, put inside uh, a space. So what um, it is here to see, this is the setting of the loudspeakers. Uh, on the, your left side, you can see there are loudspeakers all above the ceiling, but also all around the space. And this is a special format. Maybe the cinema enthusiasts uh, know about it. This is the so-called Dolby Atmos uh, technology. And we have collaborated with Dolby, uh, Russia and with Dolby United Kingdom, and they made 
the final outcome of the sound in this spatial distribution. So uh, viewing the cinema, you the listener was having a kind of holographic or in a way maybe a kind of metaverse uh, feeling of the sounds all around the space where uh, the listeners were sitting. And uh, finally, uh, for this project, I would like to show the first sequence uh, uh, at the beginning. <laughs> So maybe you have heard the transmitter uh, at the beginning. Uh, it is, I think, not easy to realize how these sounds have been captured. But... Mario, Mario, yes. excuse yes. me. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you. In fact, it's so fascinating what you're presenting. Uh, we, we, we OK, no, no problem. I, uh, time, yeah? Okay. That's fine. No, I, I can finish if it's uh, the time over. That's not the problem. It's fine for me. I can. You you can just come to the end of your idea. <laughs> then. Yes. Yes. I would like to say that uh, the idea of the polymediality is that in LA it enables to put things that usually uh, heterogeneous or maybe on in other words, they don't fit together and it is impossible uh, usually to be put together uh, to connect all these heterogeneous elements together. And with heterogeneous elements, I mean not only musical elements, it is the visual dimension, it is the technological uh, dimension. And the idea why it is called polymedia and not multimedia, it draws back to a concept of Aristoteles, the so-called sensorium commune, Although by Aristoteles, it is most a senseful uh, meaning. In my uh, case, it has a meaning for the quality and the sense why the various elements are being put uh, together. So that's why polymedia, because the sense establishing radio be between the various elements, is more important than the quantity of the elements are, that are being involved. So, thank, thank you, you Maria. Well. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, very of very course, uh, questions and remarks, but only after the second lecture. So, Ioannis, please. <laughs> yes, yes, we are running out of time. Thanks very much, Marius. Uh, we are going, we are now, um, according to the schedule, our uh, second presentation is by Karen Lemmer, who is a member of class four of the Academy and uh, Vice Dean and Professor of Analytical Chemistry at the Faculty of Science, Polatsky University, Czech Republic, Czechia. His research includes the material analysis of artworks, as well as the study of uh, binders and colorants, the analysis of uh, physiological active uh, bounds, as well as uh, mass spectrometry analysis and its hyphenation with high performance, liquid chrom chrom chromatography and uh, fluid chromatography. And also the investigation of ion mobility, separation, and ionization with the focus on desorption, nano electrospray, et cetera, and also up to the field of toxicological analysis. Uh, he's the co-author of more than 130 professional publications, and he's the Hanus Medal alumni awarded by the Czech Chemical Society. Uh, Karl Rebner as an administrator and co-administrator has participated in a number of research projects. His teaching activities include lectures and seminars focused on the basics of analytical chemistry. And he's a member, as I said, uh, to our class, to our class four in our academy, and also uh, of um, uh, various uh, scientific uh, societies in um, Czech Republic, Czechia, and other foreign expert societies. Uh, I'm glad to uh, present uh, Carl Lemmer, and please, Carl, the screen is yours. So thank you, Yannis, for your kind introduction. And 
good evening to all participants. Actually, I would like to start my talk uh, about analytic chemistry and mass spectrometry. Just to mention that uh, I will present a few examples, but I have to say that analytic chemistry and of course also mass spectrometry uh, are really a useful tool in the investigation of uh, cultural heritage objects. So I hope that you can see my screen and uh, the first slide actually just show that there are something what we actually meet here because we are talking about science meet art, art meet science. And uh, at this slide, you can see various specialists participate in cultural heritage investigation, care and research. And just one part of them, of course, they are chemists and I am analytical chemist. So it's uh, our, let's say, contribution to, to others to understand uh, the old, uh, old masters. Uh, this screen just show that uh, our technology, which is shown here, can meet uh, can meet art and how we can meet art. Actually, we would like to offer some information. We would like to offer information to other art historians and the others to understand, to get a deeper insight in uh, in the artworks. Um, so there is uh, one, uh, there is one uh, uh, really nice, uh, nice paper, another beauty of analytic chemistry, chemical analysis of inorganic pigments of art and archeology, span which is from these authors. And I just would like to mention this paper because it might be maybe useful for you, you, are, you would like to, to read more about, uh, about this topic. So it's just, uh, some idea where you can find some, uh, let's say, introduction to this, uh, to this area. And uh, in this topic, it's also possible to see uh, some history. Actually, also analytic chemistry has its own history, as well as analytic chemistry in, uh, in the area of uh, cultural heritage characterization analysis. I can say that actually the first uh, dated, uh, dated uh, studies were published or uh, disseminated in 18th century. In the beginning, there was just qualitative an analysis with different chemical tests to understand or to discover materials that were used for, uh, that were used for uh, in the art, or also to understand some uh, changes of material. Let's say around the middle of the 20th century, there, this is the uh, area that uh, new instrumental techniques are uh, involved in uh, this investigation. Of course, starting from microscopy uh, through chromatography, and uh, technique based on mass to charge ratio, which is actually also mass spectrometry. Today, uh, we can uh, consider uh, we can consider that we are in expansion period, because uh, I can recognize I it's possible to recognize that on some conferences, for example, there are focus on uh, analytical techniques as mass spectrometry, and it contains some biological investigation and uh, pharmaceutical and uh, forensic applications that in maybe last five, 10 years, we can, we can meet there also uh, some space for culture heritage characterization for mass spectrometry and culture heritage. And I believe that this is really nice uh, possibility because in my personal experience is that it's really interesting to stay, to be together with the people who are involved in art history and in uh, conservative sciences and discuss with them details and interact with them and discuss what actually they need. 
uh, what can offer instrumental techniques in analytic chemistry? Of course, we can determine chemical composition. We can say uh, what elements, what compounds are present. But it's not just uh, only this synthesis important. We can also offer some information, for example, concerning crystals, crystal structure. And uh, I will show one example when uh, we have two different crystal structures, the same chemical composition, but the different, uh, but the different uh, optical properties. Then we are interested in, uh, for example, texture and uh, stratigraphy, and also we would like to understand or to investigate it, some microdomains. That means, for example, uh, some small area uh, at the investigated samples. Uh, I will focus mainly on actually my top, my uh, specialization is analytical methods, but it's not possible to talk about uh, investigation. Uh, investigation of uh, artworks without, without uh, let's say, picture, because we need also some view, some picture to be able to understand, uh, to understand and uh, to have detailed knowledge about, about the material and technology used. In principle, analytic method, of course, can be uh, so non-invasive, which is which is preferred, of course. It's uh, if we can get information without sampling, it's surely better way how to do it. So that means non-invasive methods and even metal method that we can apply in situ. That means we can go to the museum, we can go to the castle, we can measure directly at these places. It's prefer it is preferable. However. Sometimes these approaches, these approaches can offer uh, can offer enough information, and we should consider other possibilities. Which means, is it useful to apply some invasive methods, which means to sample the object? Invasive method needs some uh, amount of sample. Of course, we as another chemist. We are trying to develop methods that uh, are able to provide information from a really tiny amount of sample. Of course, it depends on the method. Invasive method then can be destructive and non-destructive. Non-destructive, it means that we can use sample repeatedly, which is of course useful if you can get different information, you can um, look at the sample details by different analytical methods. But sometimes, of course, we have to use destructive methods because, for example, they can have, for example, they can have higher sensitivity. We can see uh, low content of some compounds that can be can be marker of, uh, for example, uh, actually last uh, in the last year we were working on uh, markers of indigo. That means origin of indigo. We are interested in, so it's one word we are working on. Oh, and, and for that purpose, for example, destructive method was an option. So actually we can look at the, at the figure. Uh, we can make a photo in infrared, UV. Uh, we can make even, we can use even portable instruments as a Raman spectrometer and so on. But I would like today to focus on less, uh, let's say, the method that are not so, uh, or that we can see them as uh, sometimes uh, we can see on them critically because it need they need sample. Why we need the sample? One reason is that if we are interested in stratigraphy, that means uh, we need cross sections of the multi-layer, multi-layer, uh, actually multi-layer sample. This figure show different layers from varnish, glaze, uh, paint layer, underpainting, and so on, uh, from here to support. I have to say, of course, that this is just scheme and uh, not all paintings, of course, they have this structure. It might be 
some less number of different layers, for example, present and so on. But if you have such stratigraphy, such uh, cross sections, what we would like to know, actually we would like to know what is in individual layers. That means what is a vanish? What is, what pigment was used in uh, painting layers? What is uh, size layer, for example? That means we need tools that are able to look at the individual layers. Of course, it, it is possible partly to do non-invasive technique. Non-invasive techniques such as looking from this side on the painting and can discover, for example, drawing, drawing uh, with carbon, for example, and it's possible. But detailed investigation, for example, especially organic compounds, which is, uh, for, for example, binders, and uh, to understand precisely the structure, the structure of uh, painting cross sections, for that reason, I believe sometimes it's really useful to take microsample and to work with the microsample. Of course, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, we need some picture. We actually need to see what we should analyze. This is one example, of course, it's just, it's just, uh, uh, it's just one, uh, optical, optical, optical image. Uh, and here we were interested in this layer that was marked layer three. This is the first view. And of course we can look at the other picture. We can use electron microscopy. Electron microscopy is shown here. And uh, in this figure, there is Actually, two techniques are combined. Electron microscopy that show this, uh, this figure and, and energy dispersive X-ray spectrometry. We can do this experiment at the same time. We can look at the figure. We can look at, uh, we can use this electron dispersive uh, X-ray spectrometry, which is actually a technique that electron that are, uh, that are, uh, collide with the surface. Uh, the output is then that we can follow some X-ray and uh, this uh, can uh, offer to see elemental composition and elemental composition in individual layers. For example, you can see here the signal of copper. That means copper is actually in the beginning or maybe it's better seen here. Uh, in the first layer. And we can also, we can get such map, such elemental map. And you see that the highest level of copper is actually in the first layer. And it, it is some hit. We can say, okay, copper, we can consider some uh, copper pigment, which can be azurite, which can be malachite and so on. The other element showing, uh, that is showing here is uh, calcium, which is actually, the matrix, the matrix of the sample. Similar situation, we have also this, uh, the other sample. By the way, these are the samples from one Czech castle. And we were interested in, again, this uh, same mark layer three, but it's different sample, which is, which is here. And you can now try to uh, fix, to see this figure and I can go further. So this is, electron microscopy, and this is the elemental composition. And we can see clearly that in the first layer or this investigated layer, we have lead and sulfur, which of course is some hit what uh, we can expect. We can expect uh, in, in the sample, that means some lead pigment was used in, in this case. Uh, but I have to mention that there is also some uh, advantage of this technique, I mean, electron microscopy is not directly related to uh, chemical analysis. Of course, chemical analysis is uh, this uh, elemental profile. But we can, in this example, we can see here some uh, content of fossils, which actually is clear mark that uh, we are looking at 
at chalk actually as a matrix. So this is the first uh, what we have to do with the sample if we need some complex investigation. We need to see some picture, some figure. Optical in, the, in uh, visible range, we can see, uh, we can follow uh, the sample in UV. And of course, we can use electron microscopy to see some details. And now in electron microscopy, we are touching together with uh, chemical analysis determining the, these, uh, these elements. I mentioned in the beginning that, of course, it's important to know what kind of compounds are present, what is a chemical composition. But I have here one example that contain, uh, actually, I'm not sure because I see in my, in my screen uh, this, uh, something from Zoom, but I'm not sure if you can see it's X-ray diffraction. There are two compounds, rutile and antis, which is actually both, they have the same chemical composition. It's uh, titanium dioxide. But you know probably why it's important to differentiate between them, because they have different optical properties, not just optical, but if we are talking about painting different optical properties and even they were available in different time. So use one or the second, we can uh, also to make some, uh, not to exactly, but some dating, let's say. Okay, so uh, if we have some work of art, typically, actually what we, we are using, actually what is our perception? We are looking at some work of art and we see, we see some colors, which means actually that uh, this object actually interact in uh, this region, which is visible region of, uh, uh, of spectrum. And not just for the perception of the work of art, but also for the investigation, we can use, we can use such interaction. I would like here first to mention one uh, actually techniques so-called X-ray fluorescence, which is portable, which you can go, you can take this instrument uh, and uh, you can get some information and without sampling. Why I am talking about? Because it's other important point. First investigation, we are typically doing non-invasively. And according to results, we can, specify where it's useful to make sampling, which is really important to make this decision because it's not possible to, to sample so many, uh, so, many, so many points, for example, on some canvas and so on. And this technique is sometimes useful for the first investigation. Here is uh, some spectrum. And you can see that uh, there is the presence of zinc, which the measurement was done here. It's actually a painted wooden chest from 19th century. White pigment was confirmed as zinc white. For this, it's fine. We don't need to take sample. We have the result that we are we're looking for. But sometimes it's not so clear and we can specify the points where the sampling can be used. And uh, from this, uh, from this, uh, after this decision, we can take sample. Of course, I will, I will talk about Raman and infrared spectros spectrometry. I have to say that we have also portable instruments, but to investigate stratigraphy or cross sections, because we need the sample. Why I'm talking about Raman, Raman and infrared. spectroscopy because in Raman we are using scattering in infrared absorption actually is uh, physical uh, processes that are also important for uh, for our precipitate uh, for our feeling for our uh, interaction with uh, with the work of art okay so in Raman there is a scattering that can offer us information about chemical bonds actually, about the presence of chemical groups in a molecule, about the structure of molecule. Similar 
we can get from infrared, infrared spectroscopy. So, and it's not just measurement of the sample, but we can use this technique as uh, microscopy, Raman or infrared microscopy. You can see the instrument for Raman microscopy here. What is important that you see there is the, it's uh, actually the screen with the, with the uh, picture of, uh, of sample. And you can see small details actually just in this point now, when this photo was uh, this photo was taken, we were measured, and we of course we can measure in different points, and even we can do imaging of some area. Uh, so that is uh, one uh, measurement from Raman spectroscopy, just uh, to show some output sample from uh, Baptista Fontaine, and uh, we confirm the presence of nematite. This investigation was done that uh, there was some comparison of different samples from different area to recognize if the technology of the authors was uh, the same during, during the time. This is the example of infrared microscopy and infrared spectra. Actually, I don't want to discuss in detail the spectra, but what you can see here, we can identify Raman spectroscopy, uh, the example I was showing, actually allows, allowed us to identify pigments. Infrared spectrometry, as shown this figure, is useful for the investigation of binders, beeswax, linseed oil, gum, arabic, casein, and you can see that the spectra are really different. I have to say that it's not so easy all the time to get this information because if you have complex sample, you can have mixture of some of them. Of course, the spectrum is not so straightforward, but in principle, it's possible. The example I would like to show is uh, from the paper of uh, these authors. They investigated uh, painting canvas of Santa Irene by Giuseppe Verio, and they use uh, they use uh, analysis of different layers. That means they have. To, they needed a sample. They uh, took three samples from this, uh, from this painting. And uh, the first output uh, concerns uh, identification of different uh, pigments, lead white, hematite, or organic dyes in this case, indigo alizarin, in different layers. So they have three samples. But for each sample, they analyze different layers, which was actually really, really useful and uh, uh, allowed them uh, to understand uh, yeah. technology. So there was two techniques, Raman and French spectro spectrometry, and now I am father. This technique that I'm showing uh, now is actually the output of so-called GCMS, which is gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And what is important? It offers us information about organic components of the sample. And in this, uh, in this work, they actually, uh, they found uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, uh, some determinate resign, uh, oil and glue. It's just a list of compounds they were able to identify. And I would like at least to show the, the, one, statement, the one statement of the authors. It was important for identifying binders, glues, vanishes, and they say, it is therefore assumed that the paper was glued to the original canvas with a mixture of animal glue, oil binders, and panacea resin. This is actually the information that analog chemists should provide. Of course, in the interaction with the uh, with the uh, art histor historians, there is no reason to show spectra, to show chromatogram, to show data. But this is the output of uh, that uh, should analog chemist provide uh, the, to the colleague. Uh, actually, this is the example of our work. We uh, identify uh, different plant gums uh, just shortly. 
the problem of this analysis is not just uh, that you need to identify uh, Binder, for example, but the problem is that the, the sample can be contaminated. In this case, there was a sample from the uh, paper surf from the paper, and there was traces of paper in the sample, and uh, it can dramatically uh, change the output. So it's important to develop methods that is able. Uh, or that, uh, yeah, that is able to differentiate or to be enough selective and the metrics of the sample is not uh, negatively, is not uh, influence, influence, doesn't influence uh, the output. We also uh, met uh, some uh, requirement to distinguish, uh, to distinguish indigo. It is, uh, the question was, is it middle age? Painting. The problem is that uh, there was some possibility in the sample is indigo, which might be middle age, or Russian blue, which actually was synthesized in 18th century. So uh, these two colorants, it's possible to discriminate uh, the other technique. But at that case, the sample was really thin. It was almost invisible. It was some painting that was stolen and then damage return. Uh, the San Sebastian Church in Miklov, Czech Republic. And we developed methods. I don't want to go to the details, but what is it, again important? There is a blue 20th century, blue 20th, Russian blue, indigo. And uh, this is a really small sample from this uh, painting. And we detected Russian blue, which actually means that. Uh, the paint is not so old, or of course it may be some uh, some uh, new drawing or some new painting on the surface. It was the question every time. Uh, actually, last uh, part of my talk, I would like to show a few slides concerning mass spectrometry imaging. We are talking about paintings, about image. And uh, I mentioned also that with Raman or reference spectrometry, we can get, or of course, spectral microscope, you can get some image. Uh, mass spectrometry can offer also image. It's well-known techniques used for biological samples, for uh, tissue anal analysis. And we are developing, not just we, but uh, also the other groups, develop methods for uh, imaging of uh, work of art. What is important? Actually, one question is, resolution. And it's one point that we try to improve the resolution of the mass spectrometry imaging to get clear, clear image. One technique that can be used for this uh, analysis is so-called laser ablation. Actually, laser just uh, causes that uh, small amount of material, it might be tens of nanograms, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, transfer from the sample to the mass spec. And you can see, you can get profile, in this case, a profile of metals. So you can, you can get some profile. It's shown also in this direction that you can see that copper is increasing, chromium is decreasing, and uh, you can sample the material by laser, which means that it's, uh, of course, you lost some material, but a relatively small amount. These details is one option. This same techniques was used to investigate uh, cross sections from uh, this uh, painting attributed to Jacob Pontormo, uh, member of the Medici family. And what you can see, it is optical image, and you can see different elements in different layers. So I mean, these techniques show you actually the profile of elements in different layer of paintings, which might be useful for the understanding of uh, technology. The other technique is so-called secondary ion mass spectrometry. When we emit ion, uh, actually, uh, yeah, emit ions, the ions uh, from ion gun actually influence the surface and secondary ions are emitted in this, in this direction. And again, there was some uh, investigation of cross sections. Just shortly, you can see 
uh, optical image and distribution of different, uh, different elements. It's this technique, however, offers to follow both inorganic and organic compounds. So you can see distribution, for example, of cadmium, but you can see also the distribution of uh, long chain fatty acids, which actually are marker of oil binder. And you can follow also some ions that are related to the amino acids. So, uh, the last techniques is uh, so-called desorption electrospray, and all these techniques actually they use some interaction of the surface with something, with laser, with ions, and with charged droplets in this case. And again, you can you can get some distribution of compounds in this case, other like acid, which actually is related to degradation of uh, oil binders in the in the painting. Similarly. It was also used for uh, this uh, painting from 1630. And again, the distribution of different compounds, stearic acid, azelic acid, again, the compounds that are related, related to oil binder. And last example from our lab, we were, uh, we analyzed some uh, surface to, differentiate between egg yolk and walnut oil. The same technique, just to make image of this, of this sample, which is some mock-up sample of wall painting. And there is the responses. Uh, there is the uh, answers to the questions. Another chemist should say, not that I am following ion 7H2, but I see egg yolk, I see walnut oil, and so on. So to conclude, I have to say that today we have really nice tools with high selectivity and sensitivity. We are able to follow elements, compounds. We can do bulk analysis. That means to determine the average content of something, or we can, use, we can do also local area characterization, which means that we can look at specific point and uh, analyze this point, or even we can do imaging. That means we can offer chemical map over the, over the cross sections, for example. Sometimes, and it's fine if it's possible, we can do in-situ measurement. Of course, if possible, we can do non-invasive. If not, we have to do micro-invasive. Of course, there are some limits that has to be understand. And of course, it's not, it's our, our task to explain the limits. For example, in shape and size of the objects. Of course, sometimes the analysis is uh, pretty expensive due to expensive instruments. Sometimes we have to explain why it's not possible to use non-portable instruments. But in all these examples, what I was showing is important to interact, to talk together, to specify or to formulate questions and together to look for the answers. So in the end, I would like to thank my colleague and uh, I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleague. Thank you very much, uh, Karel. That was a very interesting and illuminating presentation of mass spectrometry in art, as well as currently used other uh, techniques. So it was a very brief and very interesting interview. Uh, we can go uh, move on to the discussion section, and I would like to uh, uh, ask Violeta uh, to start the question with the first presentation. Thank you very much. So inspiring. I always was thinking about possible cons uh, correspondences between musical analysis and chemistry analysis. So I would like to ask you, are there any questions or remarks for our first speaker, Marios Elia? And also you may put also questions in the chat and I can also receive them. Thank you very much. So- Can I ask you? Hello? Oh? Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, okay. uh, my question uh, concerns uh, the first speaker at first and um, I mentioned it in my greetings, uh, absolutely fascinating, this uh, concept of uh, uh, polymediality. 
Uh, and I mentioned it, it reminds me, but uh, I think in general, it reminds us of uh, uh, multimedia technology nowadays. That means on the digital basis, the integration of, um, of different uh, uh, media. And um, you uh, presented uh, some examples from uh, different cities. Um, here I'm living in uh, Munich and, uh, you know, Munich, besides historical um, uh, documents, there are uh, autocar production. And uh, I learned uh, that uh, um, our um, speaker and composer uh, here uh, got the prize of BMW. You know, BMW, that's a car production. Henry. Because uh, he was able to... Uh, uh, to uh, to find to find the sound of this city with uh, automobility, which is integrated in his uh, uh, compositions. But uh, my question is a historical one. Um, it seems to be that is uh, rather new. But on the other side, uh, you know perhaps that there is a certain uh, tradition in the history of music for this kind of uh, polymediality. Uh, when you presented us uh, the sound of Vladivostok, <laughs> I, uh, I had the impression uh, Tchaikovsky. You know Tchaikovsky at the occasion of the victory of, over uh, Napoleon, I think it is uh, 1810, uh, he um, uh, composed uh, a famous, uh, um, famous music and in this music integrated not only um, uh, a chorus, not only uh, traditional music, but also the sound of guns and uh, the sound of uh, uh, bells at the occasion of the victory. So um, my, my historical question is, are you aware of uh, this uh, tradition in, uh, in music? Thank you. So dear Professor President, dear Dr. Meinzer, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, comments and actually you have mentioned many things that might need maybe one more presentation uh, to uh, elucidate. So uh, you have mentioned BMW, actually the first big projects that I made was sponsored by Mercedes after BMW and this was in Mannheim for the 125th anniversary of the automobile and the idea behind was that 80 cars um, are used as percussion instruments. 120 musicians, young people, uh, take classes uh, for one year and they learn how to play the cars musically. But the idea is not just to use such an outer or extraneous musical element. The idea is to combine it with musical elements. That's why uh, the car orchestra played together with a symphony orchestra, with a choir, and at the same time there was a, a multimedia uh, surrounding of the whole things, and there the agora got negative. This means, or maybe more precisely, the ancient theater, because in the ancient theater, the happenings are in the center, and the audiences are maybe in the front or all around like the Colosseum. In this case, it was the opposite. And to enable the uh, sound distribution all around the central square, uh, you can imagine there were 20,000 spectators. There was a specially developed sound system with 298 uh, loudspeakers. What I want to say is that the technology is not necessary there to give an avant-gardistic sound experience. So this is one element. And this is maybe more associated with the historical background. Of course, uh, the history goes even further uh, in our ancestors, even in ancient tragedies, or um, they used various effects to imitate natural sounds. So already our uh, ancient Greeks uh, in dramas, uh, in comedies and tragedies, they use these sound effects, but also Mozart, uh, was in Bavaria <laughs> at that time in Salzburg and in Vienna and of course in Munich. He used sound effects for his symphonies. And of course Tchaikovsky and what you see there with the canons, of course Russia is a, 
country proud of its military, proud of its achievements, uh, proud of its patriotism. So this is part of a project. And another important element to say is that these projects and why I, what I mentioned at the beginning, they are meant to have this participatory participa dimension. So people take part and there is this uh, communication. And I try to make it in such, uh, let's see, outcome that it is understandable uh, in a way. That's why I try to explain uh, and not just present the final product, but to explain how all this comes together. It might look easy in the end, but it is not uh, as easy in the process. And multimedia, like you mentioned before, it has more this technological uh, understanding. In my case, I think, and this is the step further, technology is a part of it. It is not the main uh, focus. And um, uh, it's more, for example, what I uh, wanted to show another example before, it was a project that I did, uh, this with the Guinness records, and many cities, they were performing at the same time. So technology enabled that people are sitting in one space, a kind of physical metaverse, and they all play uh, together. So the character of the music is the one, and then the technical realization dimension is the other thing. Marius, uh, 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 Klaus Benzer asked you about Tchaikovsky, Levadivostok. Yes, yes I said uh, that. He mentioned that. It's a Petri I mentioned it, and I said that also other composers, also the in the ancient Greek dramas, okay. and um, uh, okay. there, there was also another Russian composer, I forgot now his name, that he even thought that in his concert there will be also smelling and the kind of religious aspects. So this um, uh, meta dimension of music has been through the ages uh, repeatedly practiced. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Look, uh, uh, Grönke, Katja Grönke, uh, this is, wrote us over to yes, this is the name of the piece yes <laughs> okay good so i would like just to announce you the rector costas guliamos uh, wrote you also i don't know if you uh, if you saw compositions of polytopic sounds are marvelous powerful <laughs> concept and synthesis bravo and then yeah. denis august Chirka. Thank you, Professor Marius, in which of your work you think polymediality best suited to nature, icon, items, mentality of a nation. And so, thank you. And then, um, um, I think somebody, so, so wait a minute. Um, I, yeah, there is also a question. If you are going to present also where I wrote, I saw it. It's by, by Denise Oguz. Do you plan? Uh, then, to, then, for Denise, that? Yeah, okay, okay. Do you plan, exactly, excuse <laughs> me. Thank you. Do you plan to conduct any recordings outer in space? <laughs> cosmical, <laughs> cosmical. <laughs> and he says, thank you. <laughs> I suppose you, you are going to do this. I think no, music Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> We already had this communication through the chat, but the floor is yours. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. So uh, is somebody else also to, to um, who is writing the, the composer who wanted to incorporate smell and colors and dance? And this is um, ah, Skriabin, of course. Skriabin, yes, Skriabin, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so are there other remarks or questions for Marius, for our Marius? <laughs> so, which one is the next city? I want to know. The next city was uh, supposed to be Moscow, actually, uh, but due to the pandemic, it has been postponed, and we are waiting for <laughs> news. <laughs> yes, Marius, I have a, <laughs> a question. When I saw you show show us some some um, part of a fragment of your score, and I saw in the bus you have a far radius, far radius me. So it was correct F this yeah. A, or it was maybe it has to be this this A. I just want because it is also possible F this A, but <laughs> before you had <laughs> so I just I'm uh, very curious. 
I need to uh, to look which bus. <laughs> and the bus is two voices of the bus uh, voice. And um, before it was uh, always a planet um, at so, and then this is a familiar at at once, far radius. So that was just, I was curious if it's a mistake. I need to. Uh, it might be a mistake, yes, because there was a copy of the score, which I didn't have time to look, but ah, okay, I will okay. look for your question, uh, <laughs> and I promise to answer after. <laughs> but after it, 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 you, it's good. You're also very interesting, because the Obere und Untere Leiton, why not? Actually, I am trying... I am trying to be as practical as possible to the realization. I think okay. this is also eco-friendly to the musicians. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mario. Thank you very much. Very Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Is, uh, there is other other question. If not, I would like to ask Ioannis to to to. Thank you, Yeah. Uh, yes, I would like to ask you if you have any questions, uh, to make any comments uh, regarding the second presentation by Carl Lembro on spectroscopy and other analytical techniques applied to art objects. Can I ask you? No. Can I ask you? Yes, uh, George Duca uh, Dukas. Yes, George Dukas. <laughs> George Dukas, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I thank you for your invitation to participate in a very interesting uh, meeting, very interesting meeting. For me, first presentation, I felt the paradise. Thank you so much. And second, uh, I, like I, I am, uh, <clears throat> I am a physical, a physical eco chemist. Uh, second is very interesting presentation. I, I want to ask Professor, uh, Professor Karel, yes? Uh, what uh, what field is this? Is the analytical, analytical chemistry of arts, or physical chemical methods uh, of arts, or uh, or chemistry of arts? Because it's very interesting. I, I I remember ten years ago I visited uh, Firenze University, and uh, I visited the laboratory of chemistry, physical chemistry of arts. What is this? What field is this? I need, uh, actually, uh, I, I am actually I am an analytic chemist, so I should say it's analytic chemistry. But it's uh, actually, uh, I mean that in lab uh, there is focus on work of art. You can meet physical methods, pure physical methods. For example, electron microscopy, of course, is not a, I would say analytic chemistry method. Okay, electron dispersive X-ray, yes. So that means. Uh, it's uh, uh, in such lab, you can meet specialists in physics, chemistry. It's not just analytic chemistry, but of course our analytic methods are based on physical chemistry. It's yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's uh, one point, but I have to say that it was really, I would say shreds of, uh, of everything what is possible, for example, we have uh, tight cooperation with physics that are using uh, from uh, some uh, laser scanning, uh, tele spectroscopy, and so on. That means, I mean that uh, in the area of ver characterization, not to say analysis, but characterization of artwork, we can meet different specializations. But what I what I see that is more critical. I mean that we are pretty able to discuss with uh, other natural sciences, but what we have to find is some uh, common speech with people from humanities, people that are uh, curators at museum and so on. So that means uh, in lab, it's physics, geologists, chemists, you can find such people in the lab, but these people have to be able to communicate with the other specializations, which are focused on history, art. And I have to say my personal opinion is, it's really nice to be before painting, wall painting, to say what I see, because I see pigments, for example, and to listen what see 
people that are involved in art and history. It's really nice. So, I mean, this lab is, uh, there is multi specializations, but it's not enough because we need this discussion with the people from uh, not other bank, I would to say, with people that, that they have different, different knowledge, different feeling, different opinion, different. So it's really nice to discuss. But back to your question, physicists, geologists, biologists, chemists. I understand because uh, my, my science, ecological chemistry, uh, protect nature. And your science, uh, I understand uh, chemistry, physics, uh, geology, and other, 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 other protect us. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I, I may add in this uh, question uh, every subject, actually, uh, in, in the natural sciences, they, when they, when uh, is applied to archaeology and art and culture, okay, they may uh, choose a title which has the first part of their particular subject. For example, analytical chemistry or geology or astronomy, and the second part to be the art object or the monument. Uh, but all these uh, are under the umbrella, the, you know, of archaeometry. This is the, yeah. the word that is coins, you know, all all these subjects. Yeah, right. Measurements in ancient yeah. uh, monuments, archaeometry, archaeometry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Yeah. But <laughs> any more questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hmm. Any more questions? No? Yes, I have a question. I have two questions. Yes. My name is Adalbert. I'm not visible. Um, on yeah, the we can I don't know you. why. And um, to um, uh, Professor Lehmer, um, I thank you very much for this um, very interesting um, uh, lecture. Uh, because uh, some aspects were very new for me. And um, um, on the other hand, I uh, often uh, pursue um, programs of Egyptian uh, archaeology or uh, um, um, archaeology of, of the antiques. And uh, but now I would like to pick up to pick out um, another example and uh, to go more on the uh, in, into the practical realm of thought of this uh, what you explained um, to my knowledge the last supper of um, leonardo da vinci is a paint is a painting which is very much in danger because it is painted just on a bare wall and um, do you know by chance uh, possibilities um, how to save this um, uh, this painting for the world uh, for for uh, coming generations? There, what have what will a natural sky science uh, naturally um, concretely do have to do uh, to save this painting, for instance? Yeah, actually, I have to say, to be honest, I can or we as an alchemist can provide information about the process of degradation. We can provide information actually what is wrong, but uh, we have to ask our colleagues, other chemists or engineers to, to offer some solution. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not uh, involved in technology, mm -hmm. so I am not able, of course, to discuss detail. But we have cooperation with uh, such uh, such people, and of course, it's uh, sorry I am not talking uh, about uh, this uh, uh, this work of art because uh, I don't know details about that. But in general, we we actually saw something similar, some wall painting in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were able to determine the, or to mm -hmm. investigate or to provide data about the processes of degradation, mm -hmm. our colleague, our other chemist uh, that is involved in material, uh, yeah. material yeah. sciences, they offer some solution. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we were able to offer a method that mm -hmm. tested, they, they process, of course, on mock-up samples and so on, mm -hmm. to be able to recognize if these 
if there is a, a action that should protect wall painting actually in the future can be detrimental. It's, it can happen as well. So that means we are in the beginning, we are in the, so in the other step, but in between there are people who are really involved in material science, for example. I so, agree. So I, Hello. Feel, Hello. so I feel better uh, in knowing that there are uh, methods of uh, natural science to save this painting. Yes. I may add about the, to this. Uh, this is a question which uh, needs an answer. Uh, yes, there, are, there is a speciality called conservation science. Conservators are natural scientists, mainly, you know, uh, chemical engineering, you know, mm. and uh, in working with art objects for mm. pre prevention and preventive conservation and passive conservation. Mm. So uh, the analysis that will be um, uh, obtained by, for example, uh, data by Karel uh, M, by, you know, myself, some others, you know, regarding chemistry, corrosion, decomposition, etc., the mm -hmm. substrates, you know, the profile of, of uh, in the wall of the mural painting of the, uh, if there is a, any substrate, you know, upon which, you know, the painting was made in a seco technique or fresco technique, mm -hmm. all these things are analyzed and then the conservators apply proper remedies using uh, reversible you know uh, compatible materials to with the materials of painting in order to save them and to uh, to make a good preservation for the future mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay thank you very much thank um, you. I, I still have a I, I still have a second question yeah. uh, as I'm a, a musicologist and a musician um, I would uh, turn your attraction on another question concerning music and um, how can music be saved for the future when the technical tools of recording are changing um, the last decades very quickly according to the technical progress of mankind so this is, is for the press presentation for uh, this is a question for the press presenter. Uh, yes, please. Is, uh, Mario you, you know, for instance, um, or is there a, a realm of the natural science who cares about this question in music? Yes. Can you can you reply, yes. Mario? Yes. Um, I guess what you mentioned is more the soundscape um, idea of uh, of this. Uh, is it true? Because what, what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my aim is to record sounds so as to include them in a composition. Mm -hmm. So the idea is not to reproduce the sounds simply as they are, mm -hmm. but after they are recorded, uh, I analyze the frequencies and I try to harmonize them mm -hmm. um, in the polyphony with music, or in a sequence that in a way fits together. And this is the most challenging and the most time consuming uh, phase of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding your recording techniques, uh, I am not the best specialist on it. So there is a team of sound engineers mm -hmm. and they make recordings. What I do, for example, uh, from the more artistic way, is that I use a kind of HDR technique like in photography. So I take for the same recording, various uh, uh, recording types of the same element. And then I try to put them in a polyphonic setting. And this is for me more creative. So I use these sounds as a first source for the creative process. At the same time, also there is in Kyoto a kind of uh, episode series so everyone can see and hear the original sounds, how they have been kept and how they sound in their original form. So this is a kind of a sound library. And the sound library is kind of like notes. And then my uh, yeah. let's say, function is to use them in this synthetic approach. I don't know if I have, if I have answered your question. 
Yes, I think so. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other question before uh, we Thank you. Thank close? you also very much. It was uh, Adalbert Grote, the musicologist and musician who uh, brought the questions. And I just want to yes. make a little commentary because uh, listening to your uh, explanations about your music and also listening to your music, I can't stop thinking about the possibility to analyze your layers, <laughs> the political <laughs> layers uh, with the, with the tec technique of uh, chemistry techniques and to, we can speak about scattering absorption spectrometry <laughs> stratigraphy uh, we can apply this uh, notion in the analysis of your music so that's why in fact without planning we had a, a strong correspondence between your lectures yes. <laughs> very, <beautiful. laughs> very much <laughs> so Johannes yes we, uh, we, we can close if you like the letter we say now uh, uh Yes. We say we hello again, and to we wait for you in the next uh, uh, the next semester, and the next date will be 18th of February. We can meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. And Thank take you care. Very much Thank well. you. Thank bye, bye. You. bye 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 bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.